Welcome one and all to the Ferret and Raccoon podcast episode 224. I am your one and only host for this podcast, The Angry Raccoon, bringing you another podcast for August 2023. And like I said on the previous podcast, I actually have been doing a couple things since the last one. And it's been more in the sense of, well, I actually wanted to do more, but uh, I managed to watch two films, two newer films that were actually released uh, this year, which I'm actually happy to kind of add those to the list and uh, animated list as it were, as it is a sort of animated-ish smaller podcast for the most part. But the first film I did watch over the last two weeks was Nimona, 2023's adaptation of the original comic by, I can't remember the artist slash illustrator or writer's name, but I did watch Nimona, it's currently on Netflix unfortunately, and it was good for the most part, I actually really enjoyed it. I kind of thought I would hate it given some of the um, themes or things I had kind of heard, more negative things that had been said about the comic and the author, but I kind of ignored those. I wanted to kind of go into this adaptation with a, not necessarily a clear mind, but just knowing, you know, literally nothing about it to some extent, and I did enjoy it. It is an interesting story kind of revolving around a medieval slash, slash futuristic world that the I guess story takes place in as we follow, oh, I can't even remember some of the characters' names, as we follow a knight who is essentially, well, a character who is going to become a knight, but unfortunately some things happen that put him in a very bad position, and he kind of teams up with uh, Nimona, who is, who kind of sees him more as, uh, not really an opposite, but as a, she kind of seems sees them on the same wavelength. I'm trying not to spoil too much, because it is still a very new film, and I'm sure some people want to see it, and they don't want all the details, but overall it is a really good film. I think the animation is very strong in places, especially the elements or uh, I guess Nimona's animations or how she animates for the most part, I think are really well done. I think the story does have a lot of heart and I think a lot of the messaging in the film is there and I think it's presented in a very good way, especially towards the end. And I think that is one of the strongest elements of the film. And I think it's really going to hopefully affect a lot of people in the right way. So I give the film a lot of props for that. I think the voice cast was fantastic overall. And yeah, it was a good film. Although without actually reading the original comic, you can kind of tell that some things are missing and some things aren't developed as much. There is a relationship that is established and they do literally nothing with it, which is quite unfortunate because I would have liked to seen more of that, especially given the dynamic that has kind of been created in the film. But I don't think it's something that necessarily takes away from the film. I've seen other criticisms regarding its, or I guess the original comics, LGBTQ plus themings not really being there or being misrepresented. I personally don't really care about that kind of stuff in the tent, in the sense of how it affects a narrative within a adaptation. So you know, maybe that may upset some people, so I'll let you guys know that it's there, but it's not quite there. And on a personal and technical level, I feel like there's some scenes where the film feels and looks unfinished. I won't go into too many details, but yeah, it it does seem like... It's hard to tell if it's a stylistic thing or it's a... They literally couldn't finish this for some reason. Um, a little backstory once again on this film... It was originally going to be made by Blue Sky Studios, who was a parent company of 20th Century Fox. 20th Century Fox was then bought by Disney, to which Disney, not really being a fan of said LGBTQ plus themes regarding this film, uh, cancelled the project as well as liquefying the studio Blue Sky Studios. And then I guess people who were making the film or people from Blue Skies or Netflix themselves essentially decided to finish the film, which... Once again, although I hate Netflix, I will always give them props for actually letting, you know, creators, studios, people actually make and finish and publish and, you know, release said films that they may have struggled to get other bigger studios to make. So I don't know if that's affecting how this film looks and how it plays out, but it is a slight shame if my suspicions are correct. The next film we have to talk about is going to be for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. Now, this is another film that I think a lot of people were a bit wary on based on one character's appearance, but um, I can report it is a good film. I really did enjoy it. It starts out a bit weird where 
I had my worries that it was going to be one of those kinds of films where everyone was kind of constantly talking and referencing things. But overall, it was a really fun film. It does have a few issues in the terms of the story being very, not necessarily weak, but light. And character development is somewhat non-existent to some extent, which I kind of understand because these are established characters. So maybe the writers, directors went into this film kind of with the intention of, well, well, most people know what these characters are like, which kind of contradicts the fact that this is meant to be a reboot and a different version of said characters, which I do like what they did with some of the characters, especially people like um, Marcia Splinter or just Splinter, voiced by Jackie Chan. But with one character in particular, I won't spoil who it is, this character essentially becomes useless towards the end of the film. They don't contribute anything to the story. And even when they do contribute towards the end of the film, they essentially don't develop as a character and they kind of almost become a worse character because of what they did at the end of the film. Anyone who's seen the film might know who I'm talking about, but I don't want to say who it is because that will be considered a spoiler. But it was a bit of a shame to see that character not get any, well, basically anything to some extent, which they're a character that could really do with a let's just say, personality or something different happened to them. But I have a feeling that based on the fact that this series, or I guess this film is going to get a animated series as well as a sequel, maybe they'll do something with them. Maybe they'll introduce another character from the TMNT series, a particular rival to some extent, or maybe they'll have them learn or be able to do something when it comes to other actions that could happen in the film. I'm trying desperately to tiptoe against spoiling too much in terms of this film and the uh, my knowledge of the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise. Because I am a big fan. I don't claim to know everything, but I really do enjoy the franchise. So yeah, I would highly recommend it. If you want to see a really good animated film that actually looks really beautiful, it does have that um, 2D meets 3D art style, but I think it has a really interesting way of doing it where... The backgrounds themselves, things like lightings, things like details in the face are constantly moving. It would like kind of like a scribbly, blurred effect. They honestly remind me a lot of paintings, which I think is a beautiful aesthetic, which I'd really love to see once again in another film, um, maybe even in a franchise very similar to that, which I'll kind of mention in a minute. But yeah, sticking with Turtles, more accurately, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, we have the first of three trailers to discuss, and that is going to be for TMNT, Shredder's Revenge, Dimension Shellshock, the DLC. Now, Shredder's Revenge was a game released last year, one of my favorite games of last year, essentially a throwback slash retro beat-em-up style Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. It was done by, I think, yeah, Tribute Studios, who they absolutely nailed out the park, it felt classic but fresh at the same time a lot of new stuff I think I talked about it on the end of the year podcast but yeah this is one of my favorite games from last year and it's so nice to see it getting some more content which is really awesome in terms of DLC as we have two new playable characters uh, joining it being uh, Miyamoto uh, Yusaki uh, as well as Karai um they clearly listened to uh, the fans because I think a lot of people were like, oh, can we get Yusaki Ojimbo, as some people refer to him as, which is the series he comes from, um, as well as Karai, who is a very interesting choice, being someone related to the Shredder, let's just say. And um, they both play how they should fight, where Yusaki is slightly more like strike heavy being a samurai, whereas Karai is more range based, you know, she kind of has like you know, shadow moves where, like, she's sending out projectiles and she's doing, like, downward punch attacks and uh, electric range moves, which is really cool. It's really nice to see a character that often doesn't really ever get mentioned or get included in Turtles games, so that's really awesome to see for the most part. Um, we're getting some a really cool survival mode as well, which is part of the DLC, in which you collect crystals and you upgrade your character, as you fight in different dimensions in re as a reference to different, I guess, errors, places, and other Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles games, which is really cool, as well as the fact that you can, like, mutate into enemies in the, in the game, such as, like, Bebop, Bebop and Rocksteady, which I think is a really cool concept, uh, especially for a sort of, like, survival mode for the most part. And I shouldn't really have to say this, especially if you've seen the trailer, which I'm going to put in the description of the download link. It's a gorgeous and beautiful looking game. I mean, 
it's getting more visual like variety with a free DLC slash skin palette pack. Now things are a bit confusing in terms of like what exactly is happening because this is going to be releasing on the 31st of August where the Dimension Shellshock DLC is going to be paid but I can't find any confirmed um, pricing for it. I've seen people saying seven dollars, I'm seeing some people say five dollars. If it's roughly that price range I think that's a pretty good deal especially when there are some uh, companies and games charging way more for less so I will definitely be buying that. And um, But apparently there's going to be free DLC for this game which is going to include skins and I think the Dimension Shellshock DLC is going to have color palette swaps. So you see in the trailer, you see the characters have like more shaded look. They have, um, you know, colored variants. They also have their very um, original comic book style where they're almost in sepia tone black and white with the colored bandanas, which is a really striking look. So I'm not sure if that's the free, free DLC or that's the color palette that you unlock in the survival mode. Uh, apparently there's another additional thing coming with this free DLC, no idea because they had previously kept Karaya secret up until literally just now, which is cool within this release date trailer, but I'm rambling on technicals. Um, this is what I'm going to be playing come August 31st, let me know if you want to co-op it, I'm mainly main splinter, but I'm honestly going to be giving um, Yasaki and Karaya a, a go because I obviously haven't played as them, so yeah. Um, I wanted to mention this game because I think it's a really good game. It's worth your money. It's a dirt cheap game. It's criminally underrated and yeah, not expensive at all. So it's definitely worth your time if you want a classic beat em up or you've never played a beat em up and you like or have played some of the more modern games to come out recently and you just want to get into it. This I think is a really good starting point, especially if you're just now getting into the TMNT franchise thanks to the movie that just came out. Funny how it all um, plays out and kind of well not correlates um it all adds up to some extent it's all planned out these kinds of things Nickelodeon are very clever when it comes to nostalgia and franchise power they do it in a very tasteful way whereas others do it in a very egregious way which I'm not a big fan of for the most part but the next trailer we have we're sticking kind of with games kind of with comics and kind of with something returning and that is going to be Scott Pilgrim takes off which is going to be the animated slash anime series of the Scott Pilgrim vs. the World comics, which is kind of taken inf inspiration from both the Scott Pilgrim game, the Scott Pilgrim comics, and the Scott Pilgrim film. As, I mean, literally, the gang's all here, for the most part. Like, I have to rattle off the information just so people know, so they understand the <laughs> significance of this series being a thing. Um, yeah, so the cast from the original film, directed by Edgar Wright, are all returning to reprise their roles, um, as well as um, Michael Bacall, who was also the writer on the film. Um, they're going to be, and Edgar Wright, sorry, they're going to be exclusive producers. Brian Lee O'Malley is going to be a writer and a showrunner for the series. Uh, Sain Saru, who have done a lot of animated slash anime series like Devilman Crybaby, Lure of the Wall, Ping Pong the Anime Series, The Tatami Galaxy. Um, they've done some shorts for um, Star Wars Visions, as well as a couple other things here, there, and everywhere. They're going to be the ones doing the animation. They are one of my favorite animation studios um, right now. Um, you also have Abel Gono Roya. I'm not sure how you pronounce their name because one of the O's in their name has like the little line atop of it. So I'll give you the spelling of their second name being G O N G A R A. They're going to be directing the series. Anamana Gucci, who is a band that uses 8 bit slash chiptune music to essentially, you know, make music. They're doing or their soundtrack from the game, which they did, is going to be in the series. I don't know if it's going to be, you know, new songs or just they're going to use the, the video game soundtrack. So literally, this is such a celebration to basically, yeah, um, celebrate the significance of the Scott Pilgrim franchise. A lot of people really love the film. I think most people have only ever seen the film, which is fine. Um, and, you know, just this whole celebration of one of the best comics ever made. Because the animation does look fantastic, although it's very much like fast-paced cut, like snippets from the series. It's very accurate to the comic, which is great. Um, there's some nice style change-ups where it kind of does become more anime, more video game-ish, which is nice because part of the um, aesthetic and the theming with the Scott Pilgrim series is that it is very video game-esque. It's literally, you know, Scott 
player one, whatever, um, essentially fighting, you know, evil exes in a very video game style. You know, the film references that when he you know, literally says, oh, I need a one up and that kind of stuff. Um, what else was I going to say? Yeah, and it has a nice combination, once again, of that Western and anime styles, kind of giving it a unique look for the most part. This series has, like, a golden opportunity to be more accurate to the comics, as the film is one of, if not the greatest comic book adaptation of all time. All Marvel fans can bite me, because comparing any Marvel film released compa yeah, to this is just it's no competition, really, next to Ghost World and other films. Um, yeah. Edgar made a wonderful film with, made a wonderful film being the film that came out, what, like 11 years ago or so, and yeah, with a larger animated series, they can really follow the comic a little bit closer and really develop characters. Not to spoil anything, but a few characters in the comic, let's say, discover themselves of the course of the uh, six books, and the film didn't really have time for all that development, as well as other concepts that were absent in the film that would be hard to translate to film from the comic. I can't say what they are because I'm literally, literally would be spoiling the end or, well, a, a key concept of the actual comic itself. So maybe with this series they could actually explain these or change these concepts and actually be the, the fateful adaptation that I think a lot of people wanted because I know some people were very upset about certain characters not being the characters they are at the end of the uh, comic and the film, which is perfectly fine, but I think people need to understand, at the end of the day, this is an adaptation. The comic is still there. You can still read the comic and you can still prefer the comic, but the film is there as well. And I think in terms of, you know, I mean, when you think about it, Edgar Wright and, you know, Co. were able to condense six volumes of a story into a, what, not even two hour long film in a very expertly done way. That's an achievement and that's honestly why the film is as beloved as it is because well it's just yeah it's a testament to a great job for the most part um the only thing that sucks about this series is that brie larson is going to be in this series who has become an incredibly awful unlikable person i'm not going to explain the kinds of things she's done and said because you can go and look that up it's not pretty and it will make you not like her as a person um she doesn't deserve any money personally and hopefully this is the last thing she is ever seen in because we all know that that the marvels film she's in is going to bomb hard so yeah that's an unfortunate situation and it's a netflix series so it most likely won't be advertised past this trailer because they don't like animation at all they've made it very clear that they're not interested in doing that at all hence why they cancelled several animation projects fired certain people and studios and cancelled shows you know not too long ago and it will and it probably won't see a physical release um, because they're paranoid idiots um, but on the plus side this is the last thing with Netflix name attached to it which I actually care about so once this series is saved onto my external hard drive Netflix is as good as dead to me so you know and the last trailer we have once again, sticking with animation and video games, kind of, is going to be South Park Snow Day. So we're getting another South Park uh, game, which is awesome. The previous two games being um, The Stick of Truth and The Fractured Butthole um, were pretty good as um, weird um, turn-based um, RPGs in the vein of, let's say, the Paper Mario series, which is pretty cool. And... I don't know this I mean when I look at this game I think it's pretty cool that they're trying something new they've got a new um, 3d style it's always good to see characters in a different form but ah, the, the style and how this game looks it honestly reminds me of those South Park games on N64 which weren't great games like I don't know if this is meant to be like a reference to those games but I, I don't know the characters don't really translate that well in this style I mean I, I am looking forward to the fact that this game is going to have that comedic like hyper reality that the series and the games are known for as you see like one of the characters like flying across the map obviously there's explosions um Cartman is in his like um wizard outfit which is pretty cool it's I guess it's implied that he's making the snow day happen or maybe he's gonna have some kind of AoE attack much like I believe he did in one of the games which I still do really like the aesthetic of them having powers and all that kind of stuff in the games. And I think that South Park as a game franchise has a lot of potential because there's lots of wacky and crazy ideas 
throughout the series, which is really cool, and I really do enjoy that um, element to it. But mm, the, the characters, like their movements and their facial expressions, aren't very smooth. Like they're quite sluggish. It's it, it does have an old school look in to some extent, where it's you know when you would see obvious like you know face swapping or you know deliberate slow movements. But I don't know. Maybe this is like the beta footage we're seeing I'm, I'm very interested in it i mean i forgot to mention that it is going to be a four-player co-op game where i guess you're fighting over territory it is interesting i hope it's not going to be um an online service or kind of befalls the same fate as something like the crash team rumble game which you know hasn't necessarily done too well for the most part but it is very interesting and i wanted to mention it because it could be once again a very unique experience you know if you like south park you got another game if you want to play something that is similar to the kinds of games you play online but in a sort of crazy wacky sense you've got that and i really do appreciate the fact that thq nordic as well as other people are just kind of making really out there concepts you know the landscape of gaming may be becoming generic and it is a bit depressing how every game sort of has like paid dlc or a roadmap or is constantly nickel and diming people or the games are releasing broken and you know, studios and developers are, you know, lying to their consumers' faces because all they care about is money. But when you've got games like this, it does remind you why, you know, you and anyone else who likes games, you know, does like the art form. So there's that for the most part. But yeah, that's pretty much going to wrap up the podcast, Podcast, excuse me, for the, mo- for the most part. Um, video of the episode to make up for the fact that this was a short episode is going to be uh, the Te- Te- Takeshi's Castle special revival that released earlier this year the whole i think 47 minute long episode has been uploaded to youtube now for those of you who may be younger takeshi's castle was a i think it was a an early 90s uh, japanese tv game show where essentially contestants would do a bunch of obstacles trying to make it as far as possible in order to make it to the end and essentially rescue or save Takeshi's castle which has been taken over by evil people it's a legendary show which a lot of people one of the first things I think people think about when they think of Japanese tv is just the wacky nature of these shows you've got characters running across you know um stepping stones across a lake or um trying to run through DoorDash Essentially, you can see its inspiration in a lot of other media, things like Total Wipeout or games like Fall Guys, which is basically Takeshi's Castle in some sense. It is a very influential series for the most part, and it is kind of cool to see Japan kind of go back to it, kind of do a more modern-ish take on it, which is really cool. And I think the special itself is a lot of fun to watch. So hopefully you guys will enjoy that, and maybe if you can, find some older episodes online or you know, kind of compare the two, which I think would be really interesting. But yeah, that's pretty much going to be it. The one thing I forgot to mention on the previous podcast, because um, I was having technical difficulties, which, sorry, once again, was the fact that I now have a Instagram account. That's kind of where I'm going to be posting in terms of like social media and that. I'm done with Twitter. The website's dead and dying. So don't even bother me or bother with that thing. It's just whatever um yeah you can follow me on instagram at a social raccoon one word obviously i will put the link to said instagram as well as the links to everything else i've talked about and my other channels and that in the description and the download link so yeah um follow me on there would be nice i intend to post behind the scenes content as well as additional content that probably won't be uploaded to youtube so if you're into you know travel um and collecting or collections of things then yeah definitely go follow me on that i'm not gonna spam people i don't believe in just constantly posting things and all that so um the post will be paced for the most part so hopefully you guys will enjoy that if you do decide to follow i want to thank you for listening especially if you've made it this far i really appreciate um you deciding to listen to the podcast you could do you could be doing anything else and you've decided to listen to this so i really appreciate that And yeah, I don't think there is anything else to say. Obviously, subscribe to the channel for more um, podcasts so you always know. And yeah, I guess I will end this podcast like I always do by saying I was the Angry Raccoon and I will see you on the next podcast.